who's ready to worship Jesus this morning? All right, come on, put our hands together. Hey! All right, come on, every voice, let's sing this out. Here we go. Hey! This holy desire is burning in it just.
chapels were made for so we can take a time out of our schedule and come all together and lift high the name of Jesus. And as we do that, and as we turn our hearts and our affection and our attention towards him, he's going to reaffirm your calling. He's going to whisper things. He's going to break bondage. He's going to break chains. He's going to heal you. He's going to do things that only he can do in his presence. And that's what chapels are for. And y'all encourage me with the hunger that y'all come in the room for to worship him. And Mark is uh, speaking today at chapel, which I can't wait for. He's got a message for you that's going to be really encouraging. Um, but, you know, he's also speaking at church on Sunday and he uh, in the You Ask For It series. And he's doing a parenting message. So over the course of the last couple months, we have been reflecting on what we've learned as parents. Y'all know we have four boys, so that we've learned a lot in our short years of being parents. And we started to pull up pictures and videos of when the boys were young, and just to recall what God has taught us about being parents. And it's so funny because the boys would see us pull up these videos, and then they were like, wait, share my story. What was I like as a kid? What did I do? And it was so fun. And we would show pictures of when they were born and the things that God spoke over them went before we even saw their face. And we would encourage them um, just the, the friendship that they have with each of one of their brothers and how God made them to be fight for each other, not against each other. And then we would show them videos of when they were really silly, like one of my kids called Fruit Snacks Toot Snacks. And I would just, I would ask him 500 times, what do you want? What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? Just because it's hilarious to hear him call them toot snacks. And then we would tell them stories about how they overcame sickness and God did a miracle in their life. But I share all that to say, I think today we need to be reminded of our story. And as we go back into worship, I just want us to, with fresh heart, with fresh eyes, with a fresh mind, to remember our story. Each one of our story began like this. We all chose to go our own way. We all thought that we knew better. We wanted to do what we wanted to do. And each one of us was living in sin. We we're headed on a path of destruction and death. There was no way out. There was no hope. I think sometimes we forget that. But God saw us and he couldn't stand the distance that was between us and him. And so he sent his only son down to this earth, fully God and fully man, to live a life of no sin. None. Not one time. He never slipped up. And he went to the cross. And he was murdered. And he hung on that cross with the weight of our sin. And he paid the price that we are supposed to pay. Let's don't ever forget that HC, our story is not about us. It's all about him. And so through Jesus, we were bought with a price. Your life has been paid for full. Your life has been paid for. Your life has been paid for. That's God's rescue plan. But it doesn't end there. Our story doesn't stop there. On the third day, God rose Jesus from the grave and said, I have all authority. I have the victory. I am full of power. And now that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in every single one of us to share the glory of God with the whole entire world. Our story is always about making him the hero of our story, but of everyone else's story that we meet. You see, we're going to go into an old school song. It's been on my heart over the last week. I can't get it out of my mind. He is worthy as the lamb. The blameless lamb, the sacrifice that paid the price. You guys, he is worthy of it all. He is worthy of praise. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of glory. But guess what? He's also worthy of us doing hard things. 
He's worthy of our obedience when we don't really feel like it. He's worthy of us being uncomfortable to see what he wants to shape us and mold us into. He is worthy of us giving our entire life over and over and over again to him who paid a price to purchase our life. So as we go into this song, whether you know the words or not, you'll catch on really quickly. But I want us to just surrender all over again in this moment. Maybe you have forgotten your story. Maybe you've been a little bit detached from it. But with holy hands surrendered, can we just offer our lives all over again? Everybody in this place, lift up your hands and say, God, you can have my life. Jesus, you are worthy of me doing anything. You order my steps. I'll go where you send me. God, I want to do what you have called me to do. I honor you with my life. From the tip of my head to the bottom of my feet, God, I give you charge over my mind, my eyes. Let them see you, my mouth. Lord God, put a guard over my mouth. Let me speak the things that only come from you, your truth and your word. Father, I tune my ears to hear you. God, let me hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. God, tune my ears to hear what you say about me so that I only can think about the way that you see me. God, I give you my heart, protect it. Give me your peace that passes all understanding to guard your heart, my heart and my mind in you. I give you my life all over again, my hands. Let them be full and prosper of things that bring you honor and glory. God, I give you my legs, my feet to go wherever you send me all throughout the day. God, I pray, Father, that I would encounter divine appointments to encourage, to equip, to challenge, to speak life over people wherever I meet them. Jesus, you are worthy of it all. We love you, and we give you all honor and praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the price, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame.
love worshiping with you. Say hi to a few people next to you and we'll jump into the word. up HC. I love it. I love it. I love, uh, I love these moments together. I was just thinking about how many of you guys have been to Motion Conference? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I love Motion Conference. I was just thinking about how much fun those three days are. Has God ever touched your life at Motion Conference? Anybody? Come on, make some noise. And I just had this thought during worship. What's really cool for us is, you know, Highlands College, is, it's like a semester long. It's like a two-year long conference. It's not just three days. Like three days is amazing. But the work that God can do over a whole semester is just mind-blowing. And just how layer by layer God is working in Highlands College this semester, I, I truly believe, and I think the faculty and team would agree, it's been the best semester ever. And I want to honor God for that and also want to honor all of you. Come on, team, let's honor our incredible students. We honor you guys today. Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Jill said it, and I think this is what we all feel. And really, Jill, you could have preached the whole message, by the way. I should have just let you go. Um, I love my wife. She's amazing. What's different than I think ever before is the depth of the hunger you have in your heart for God and His Word. And I just want to fan that into flame today. We're not going to spend a ton of time together. I'm excited to open up God's Word for about 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to go back into worship for, for God to continue just to move in, in what, and really what's already started in this service. I just want to point us and maybe focus us on an area. And I'm just trying, I'm going to try to be a good pastor to you today. I know it's mid-semester. You've got a lot of things going on. It's easy for something like Highlands College to become, you know, routine. It's always easy in our faith to go old covenant, right? Just works or what's next or checking it off the list. And I'm just praying that today and even this Thursday, we have a guest pastor coming, uh, Pastor Stephen Chandler, who's a phenomenal uh, preacher and leader. He's going to be here Thursday. I'm praying that this week is just kind of a, it's like a spiritual tune-up. It just just reminds us of why we came, like Jill talked about earlier, the story of God in our life. And it just pushes us into the next few weeks and, and months we have together. Y'all y'all good with that? All right, band, thank you guys. You're amazing. I would keep you up here all, the whole time, but your hands would fall off. Um, it feels so much better when you're up here. Um, here's what we're going to do. I want to I wanna just, I, there, I've been noticing something. I'm going to just start right here. And, and you know how it is when you notice something, you just start seeing it everywhere? Right? How many of y'all ever, like, bought a car? Like, you bought a red car, now there's red cars everywhere or, you know, whatever, right? Here's, you know, I started noticing, I just started recognizing this, this, this is everywhere. You know, when you really start noticing something, it's popping up in your ads because you're talking about it and your phone's listening to you, right? So after this message, we're all going to see that on our phones, right? And I think you probably have noticed this too, though. I think we probably have all noticed this. And that is right now in our culture, in, in this generation, we got issues, Come on, can I see someone testify? We got issues. I got issues. You got issues. We got issues. The world has issues. Everything's an issue. And it's funny to me because I do remember, like, growing up there was issues, but it felt like they came and went. But now it's like issues are here to stay. It's almost like this. If we don't have an issue, we feel like we're not wearing clothes. Like, we got to have an issue or something's wrong. Like, the issues of now, they're real sticky. Like, they just, they, they jump on us, and then, you know, we go from one issue to the next. And, I mean, I know there, there's a huge list uh, and I'm not saying these, these are all in this room, but, but there may be some of these issues that you're carrying into this room. You know, we got money issues. Anybody got money issues? You're like, I need some money, right? I, that's real. You're a college student. I get it. You got time issues. I don't have enough time. We, you know, we have fear issues. We're, we're afraid or there's, there's some fear attached maybe to our future or the call of God in our life. We got, of course, in our culture right now, anxiety issues. Have y'all noticed we got some political issues? We can't even disagree anymore. We just hate each other. Like, it's just everything's political, and everything is just so polarizing. Uh, we got emotional issues. Some of us, and I know a lot of people in the world right now, and maybe even some of us, have faith issues. This word deconstruction, which is now kind of on trend, it's like it's this concept now that seems to be spreading. It's almost like if, I don't, if I'm not deconstructing as a young person, then something's wrong with me. It's this issue that's come out of nowhere and is now everywhere. 
we look at your neighbor and say, we got issues. And I just started noticing it in my own life. I started noticing it around me, and now I see it everywhere. So here's the question I've been wondering. What is going on? Why we got all these issues? Come on, somebody. What's wrong with us? Put John 10, 10 on the screen. We are the children of God. It says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come so they may have life and have tons of issues. Is that what it says? What is it? Let's read it together. I have come that they may have life and, oh, you can do better than that. And I don't see anything in that verse about issues for the children of God. I see abundance. I see blessing. I see hope. I see optimism. I see faith. I see healing. Come on, I see deliverance. I see ministry. I see calling. I see provision. I see the blessing and hand of God on a generation. So why we got all these issues? What is going on? And I've just been i been digging into God's word. If you like the Bible, oh, you're in the right place because you're at Ohio's College. If you don't like the Bible, go to Alabama. <laughs> hey, sorry, Michael. Go Vols. What? Oh, my, too soon. Uh, Y'all pray for me. I had to repent. <laughs> True story, I need to repent to all Alabama fans now, but also I had to repent to my kids because on Saturday I just told them, I said, tonight, tonight your father is not going to be a good example. I am cheering against someone, and I'm not even cheering for someone. I'm just cheering against someone, and it was just too much fun. Anyway, all right, so Genesis chapter 1, we're going to hit Genesis 1 and Romans 1, which right there you're in the heart of some really deep thought and theology and truths about God. So we're going to have fun digging into this, and I think it's going to help us and I'll just go ahead and kind of give you a preview. When, I've dug, when I kind of started digging into God's word, dug into this topic, what I realized is this. Really, guys, check it out. And this is good news if we catch hold of it. And it's kind of like today's for us, but then this is what you're going to be preaching and leading out of your entire life, this truth. This, we're going to talk about the gospel today. Because really, it looks like we have a lot of issues, but really we got one big issue. And I think that's encouraging because a lot of issues is overwhelming, but if we can attack this one issue, we can get set free of it. And I think it will set us free of all the other issues that come with it. So Genesis chapter 1 says, in verses 26 through 27, it should be on the screen, says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own what? In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. We could teach a whole series on this these few verses right here, but here's what I want want you to catch, and that is that you were made in God's image. Imago Dei, this is a theology that we believe. We have the image of God inside of us, and that's, for me at least, maybe not you, but for me, that can be a really hard concept for me to really grasp. You know, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? I've just been studying and reading about it and thinking about it. You know, obviously we're made to be like God. We're made to represent God. And we're made in his image, and as followers of Jesus, when we accept Jesus and, and, and are, are, are saved, we begin not only to, to have his image, but to grow in his image. Second Corinthians talks about that. We're growing in his image. So I, um, growing up, um, Stephen and I, my brother Stephen and I, uh, we actually have two other siblings, two sisters. We grew up in a, an amazing home. I have great parents. And the, but they, they grew up in the 60s, so they were kind of like half-hippie parents, all right? I, this is, you wouldn't know. Maybe your grandparents, I don't know. But, like, they were just kind of had that energy. And one of their hobbies, favorite hobbies, was f- uh, photography. And so much so that, like, they have, in our house, we actually had a, what's called a dark room. Before digital cameras, you actually had film. And then you would process that film and turn film into, into pictures. And we had this, like, little almost like closet but dark room in our basement where my dad and mom could do that with film. They could actually develop their own film. And what was really cool is... The way that happens is you go into the room and it's a dark room. There can't be any light because you have this fo- uh, light-sensitive uh, paper, this photo paper that you put down on this. There's a machine. You put it down like on the counter. And then this machine, which is really just a really bright light that you insert the film into. And, and the film's in front of the light. And so the light shines through the film and it pushes that image down onto that, that photograph. The cool thing is this. You don't see it all at once. In fact, you don't see anything in the, in the first instant. The image is now there, but you don't see it. But over the next few minutes, next hour, two or three hours later, you come back in that room, and there's now a fully developed photograph. And I want to give you that as an illustration because I think that's the perfect image of God's, a perfect picture of God's image inside of us. 
is that when you were created, that light flashed inside of you and the image of God was put inside of you. And when you meet Jesus, that image begins to develop inside of you. And here's the goal, that it will become fully developed, right? And that's a lifelong journey. None of us are perfect. But that's what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of us. We are made in his image. And so by growing in this image, and this is what's really amazing, we get a ton of benefits. We get things, and we already talked about some of them today, but like I wrote down just the, you know, some of the fruit of the Spirit. We get self-control and purity. We get power. Uh, we get the Holy Spirit, the friendship of the Holy Spirit, relationship, creativity, intellect, peace, joy, right? All these things. How many of y'all agree those are good benefits? So as we're growing in his image, those benefits are manifesting in our life. Good things are coming from the image of God growing inside of us. Y'all got it? That's, that's what, that's what gen- all the way from Genesis chapter 1. That's God's design, that he would put his image in you, and that through, he knew in foreknowledge, right, through, through his son's death and resurrection, as Joel talked about earlier, that image could grow inside of us. Inside of us. But here's, here's the deal. Mankind has always had one major issue with God's image. Can you guess what it is? God's image is especially growing inside of us. And it's real simple, and you'll catch it as soon as I say it. It's not our image. <laughs> We've always had this wrestle of God growing in us or us growing more and more in ourself. This is the wrestle of mankind. Be our own God or accept our real Father, our God, who has, who has demonstrated over and over his love for us, that he is our creator. This is always the wrestle, right? It's our image or God's image. This is what Romans chapter 1 says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is not talking about a them. We read it like a them. I'm going to turn the mirror on myself today. I have lived this way. It's foolishness. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And here it is, everybody. They exchanged the glory or image of, of a mortal God for other images made to look like themselves. Mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. We got a lot of issues in the world right now. But really, we've always just had one issue. And I think it's very sobering and important, especially for us as believers, to come back to this truth. Our issue has always been that wrestle. We're exchanging his image for another image. We're letting, we're letting go of the promise of God to grow inside of us, and we're letting ourselves take control and grow more and more like what we want to grow into. This is the wrestle of mankind. It's our image Versus his image. Now, here's the deal, though. With God's image, there's incredible benefit, benefits that come. We talked about it, right? Y'all got it? Like all peace, joy, all that. But always, without fault, and it doesn't matter what worldview, can, no one can deny that this is the, the truth. When it's not God's image growing inside of us, there's a whole other list that starts to develop, which check it out. And this is like the revelation of today. This other list looks a lot like the issues we all have right now. Back to Romans chapter 1. They became filled with every kind of wickedness. Evil, does this sound like the world we're living in today? Wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Because they exchange the image, all these things begin to grow inside of them. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now this list, whenever, like if you're ever preaching, by the way, and you share Romans chapter 1 right there, like you you just immediately feel the room go, oh, like right, it hurts. Because it it is a mirror, oftentimes. Even as the the children of God, we allow ourselves to step back into some of these things, at least I do. I'm going to be the first one to, to acknowledge that. And now, for whatever reason, in our culture, we've just taken these issues and we've made them seem almost abstract or obscure or that there's some kind of just self-help that will set us free of them. And at the end of the day, nothing but the power of God will set us free of that list. And here's what has to change. It's going from our image back to his image. It's, it's suppressing us. It's less of us and more of God. Less of us and more of God. If you want a powerful prayer for the people of God, it is always. If you pray that every single day, you're going to be on the right track. Less of me and more of you. More of you, less of me. God, always. So here's what we got to recognize is that when God's image is growing inside of us, good things grow inside of us. And if we're facing any, in any area of your life right now, if you're facing an issue that's not a good thing that's growing inside of you, 
it's an opportunity. Not, there's no condemnation. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's no, you know, there's no shame in that. What it is is an opportunity to recognize, whoa, 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 whoa. It's like a checkup. Like, wait a minute. That's not abundant life. How many of y'all would say that God has ever set you free or healed you or done anything great in your life? If he's ever done it once, he can do it again. And it's available to you today. We just got to recognize the answer is not out there in the world to get over our issues. It's not another book. It's not another, you know, it's not meditation. It's, it's none of the, the answers the world have. It's, it's, it's what it's always going to be. And the journey always starts with us looking to God and saying, I'm going to let your image grow. And then I'm going to trust your wisdom to take next steps. I'll get the help I need, but it's going to come from leading out of your image, not my own image. So we got to recognize where we are. And then simply this, this, and this, this is the turn. And we're going we're gonna to pray here. And, and I'm going to just teach one more verse, and then we're going to pray. The turn is just to recognize we made a bad trade. And I love that God just makes a way for that through Jesus for us to recognize. And really that word is repent, right, to recognize or rectify uh, this bad trade. trade. We just got to come to the point where we recognize it's time. And that's the one thing today I came to say is in the middle of the semester at Highlands College, in the middle of this beautiful process, don't let anything but the abundant life grow inside of you. It is time for us to repent and turn in any area and let God's presence move inside of us. So um, back in, uh, t- Jill and I got married in 2005, yep, and it was amazing, and so um, we lived downtown in Birmingham in a, in a loft, I was still in graduate school at UAB, and uh, she was working, what, what were you doing, I don't even know what she was doing, it was something crazy, I was, oh, it was a gym, you were working at a gym, right, yeah, it's called my gym, a kid's gym, it was awesome. And so we were like, you know, just new, newly married couple, whatever, just kind of just figuring things out, hardly making any money. And um, we um, lived in this apartment downtown, and um, we started, we were serving here at Highlands just as dream, as dream Team, not just as, but as Dream Team, it was a huge honor. And so one night, you know, early marriage, young couple, just figuring it all out. We, we go to church, we serve at the youth ministry, it was called Switch back then. We come home, we parked, Jill, Jill had a Honda, like a 1995 Honda Accord. Any Honda Accord people out there? They never stop. They just keep going. It had like 600,000 miles on it. But it was paid for. Can I get an amen? Amen. Woo! It was paid for. So we park her Honda Accord, and we just go, you know, we go up into our apartment. We go to bed. Next morning, you know, we both wake up. I'm getting ready. She's getting ready. She she leaves before me. It's pouring down rain. I'll never forget. It's pouring down rain. And she calls me from the parking lot. And I'm kind of frustrated because I'm like, what? What's going on? She's like, I can't find the car. I don't know where we left the car. Do y'all have anybody in your life that when things are going wrong, they start laughing? That's Jill. It drives me crazy. She's like, I can't find the cards. Can you come down here? It's so crazy. I don't know where the car is. Isn't that funny? I'm like, it's not funny. I just, I'm thinking she just doesn't know where the car is. I come down, and I'm like, where's the car? I can't find the car. Y'all, our car got stolen in the middle of the night. Huge blow to us, right? And they, they ended up being like security footage. This dude stole our car in like 10 seconds. He was anointed. He had the gift of stealing cars. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, he was, what, he was good. He's like, I guess he's like, I don't even know, man. He like got, he popped the door, got in, put something in the dash, turned it, and he was out of there, right? <laughs> and so then we, anyway, we get through, long story short, we get through all this process of like getting, you know, insurance money, which was $5,000, I think is what it ended up being, for this paid off car. The car was a lot better than that, that, that $5,000 check, right, because it was a car. And now we're trying to find another car. And so I'm like in that point where I'm just like, I just want to buy the car I want to buy. And so I start looking around, and for whatever reason, it was a Nissan Maxima. I don't even know why this is the case. It was a long time ago. It's embarrassing. But anyway, so I f- I'm looking for it, and I end up finding one, y'all, not at a local dealership, like not at any kind of reputable, reputable anything. I find one on eBay Motors <laughs> in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and it's like a crazy good deal. You know, not when y'all find a good deal, you're like, God has blessed me. You know, you know, it's like every other my, the car maximo whatever was like ten thousand dollars. This was five thousand dollars. My dad was like, "You're an idiot." <laughs> Jill's dad was like, "You're an idiot," and I was like, "No, no, no, no. I am 24 years old and I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to Pittsburgh to buy this car." I got a little worried about it, so I said to my brother, Stephen, hey, yo, can you come with me on this trip? He's like, to where? I'm like, just, I'll pay for your ticket. Come with me, all right? So we fly on a plane. We go up there, and it all started going, it was bad to start with. It started going worse. We got off the plane, and I'm thinking the car is going to be at the airport. I didn't even ask any questions. And they show up to pick us up in a different car. And then I started asking other questions, like, hey, where's this dealership? They're like, hey, we'll be there in a minute. It was an hour out into the middle of nowhere. 
at this point, we are getting robbed and murdered. I'm sure of it, right? And, and we end up at this little dealership on top of this mountain. And you, know, I mean, you asked Stephen, there was like one little trailer and like six cars. It was one of those kind of dealerships. And there was this Maxima sitting there. And I, a couple things just immediately clicked. Number one, we might die. Secondly, what am I going to do if I don't buy this car now? Like I'm s- literally stuck. There was no Uber. I can't, I can't even get back to the airport. We have to buy this car. No questions asked. We'll take it. We got to get out of here. Y'all, by four, before we even got back to Birmingham, that thing had broken down. It was smoking. Over the next two years, it was issue after issue after issue. And y'all, for a long time, y'all you know how it is when you make a bad mistake. For a long time, I'm like trying to just tell it, oh, no, it's great. It was just one little thing. You know, it's just the oil issue this time. Oh, it's just the belt that broke, right? It's just the brakes that went out. I mean, it's just ran. You know, it's just, it's just the brakes, right? It was a great deal. It was $5,000. I ended up spending $15,000 or $10,000 more on a $5,000 car. And at some point, I just had to look at my dad's face and Jill's dad's face and everybody else and say, you know what? I'm going to own this. I made a bad trade. This was dumb. There had to be a point where I recognized there is no, there is no way through this. I got to go back the other direction. I got to sell this car to somebody else who doesn't know anything about it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it was, it was done. It was done. It was over. I just got to let it go and I got to move back. And we, and we got we to gotta purchase a vehicle that's going to get us to where we were always supposed to go. And I use that illustration to say, I just think some of us have come to that point in our life. It's like in this journey at HC, it's like maybe we've just believed some lives. We've made some bad trades. we got some issues that are forming. We've been trying to knock them out. It's like spot fires. We've been trying to put them out. And maybe we just need to take a step back and say, you know what? Today, I'm just going to repent. I'm going to turn back to God. I'm going to say his image is better than my image. I'm going to let that begin to grow inside of me in a way that maybe I have suppressed for whatever reason. We all do it. But today is just a day for us to turn. 2 Corinthians, last scripture. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. This is going to give us just the prescription for today, and we're going to go back into worship. It says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that's a good point for an amen right there. There is freedom. It's not, it's not that Romans 1 verse or, or scripture of list. Evil, wickedness, greed, malice, no fidelity, no love, no compassion. No, no, no. Where the Spirit of God is, there's freedom, there's good things. And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord, and here we go, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. If you want that image, the image of God to grow inside of you, an increasing glory, then I think the three words that come before it will be super helpful. Write them all down. We're going to walk through them, and then we're going to release you to pray through these on your own, and we're going to worship. Three words are this. We need to turn, we need to remove, and we get to behold. We turn, we remove, and we behold. The turn is obvious, right? We're, we're saying to God today, we're turning, and I, and I even wrote it kind of down as a prayer. It's a point, but it's also a prayer. God, I'm turning to you and you alone. And this is something I know we all did at Salvation, but can, can I tell you guys something? This is something we need to be doing every single day because there's just a lot of options out there in the world that become distractions. And again, no guilt, no condemnation, no shame. I'm, I'm, here's where I'm at today. I'm going to worship at the end of this. I'm, just, I'm getting free of anything that has been a hindrance to me, anything that's growing in me that's not the image of God. And it all starts by saying, God, I chose you as not just as Savior, but as Lord. You and you alone. I gave you the keys to my life. Now, I know I've tried to take them back, but I just, I'm just coming to you today at the altar in my chair as I worship. I'm just coming to you. I'm just turning to you and you alone. I love, I love history, so I love the story, you probably have heard it, of, of Cortez, this guy, this explorer, who comes to America, and he's, I think they have three ships. They land in uh, Central America, and they're going to, you know, on conquest, they're going to take, um, you know, to, to conquer, to take land, and they, they're looking for gold, and it's going to be dangerous and risky, and people are gonna, probably going to die, and so there's just a ton of tension around the moment where they get off the boats, and they step onto the land. If you know the story, it preaches really great. If you don't know it, study it because you can use it the rest of your preaching career. What do they do? They burn those boats. Cortez burns the boats. There is no going back. We are here, and we can only go forward. In fact, he wrote this in his journal to his men. He said, see that smoke? There is now no retreat, only forward into the unknown. 
And I think that's a beautiful picture of today, that we would just burn some boats in our life. We would just burn some of the idols, some of the things that we've been looking to. We would just burn some of those and say, you know what? There is no retreat, God, into the unknown. And the unknown with God is a faith journey. You don't see it to believe it. We just walk in faith knowing that God is going to lead us, which is what makes it beautiful in the first place. So you won't get answers when you turn to God, but you do, get, you do release control. Say, God, I'm just, I'm just giving this to you. And the second point, you know, is remove. It's, I remove all of that. And what I just said, all of that control. And this really is the moment of repentance. I think today, that tonight, or today, I'm just imagining during worship, there's a moment where you just turn to God and, and maybe you have a list. And all these, I've got I'm turning to you in these areas. And then that just flows over into a moment of repentance where we just ask God to remove that stain, remove that sin, remove that pride, remove that anger, remove that lust. Remove that, that frustration. Remove that fear. For me, getting when I first got saved, fear was crippling for me in my life. And not just like I'm afraid of ghosts or whatever. Like there was, I had some actual physical fear. Like I was, I was for whatever reason, always afraid my parents were going to die in a car wreck. I know that's crazy, but I just had this like consistent thought whenever they would leave that they weren't coming back. There were some of those things like that. But my bigger fear was a paralyzing fear that I wasn't enough, that I didn't have what it took that God could never use me in my life. So what I did is I just never did anything. I just would follow everybody else. And it was my youth pastor who looked at me one day and he said, his name was Bill. He said, Mark, you're a leader. Quit being a follower. Just get rid of that fear. And so I had to repent of that. There was no self-help through fear. I, I had to say, God, I need your power to crucify this. You saved me. You've set me free, but I know you can set me free of this. So, God, I'm asking you to remove it from my life. I'm repenting. Y'all know that repentance means that 180 turn. I'm turning completely around in the other direction. I'm going the opposite way. I'm coming to you. And I'm just praying that today there will be a moment where all of you recognize, you know, he's a good, good father, right? Where is he? He's on the doorstep waiting for you to turn. And the moment you do, God comes running to you. He's going to meet you right where you are and minister to you. And then give you the wisdom to take next steps, whether that includes getting some help from some of us or the team here or whatever that looks like. All that flows from this place of repentance. And his mercy is available. His grace is an ocean that will not run dry. And Jesus went to the cross for us. So let us not have any stronghold in our life. Amen. But we'll just repent of anything that the enemy has tried to tell us is now an issue in our life. It's stuck on us. No, no, we're going to repent and be done with it. And then the final one is behold. I know this is not a word that we use very often, but I wrote, I wrote this prayer down, and I've been praying it this week in advance of this chapel, and it's been powerful for me. And that is just, God, I want to behold your glory, and I want to be made into your image. You know, that word behold, we don't really you know, use that very often, but it, it, it means to lock your gaze, unable to look to the right or left, to stay on target. I think that's a powerful truth. I think oftentimes we may turn... There's times where we will repent and remove, but I think what keeps us or keeps us from continuing in the image and maybe allows us to then kind of stray off the path to the right or the left maybe a few days or weeks later is that we miss this last part. It, it requires for us that there's only one effort required in any of this, and that is to keep our eyes on Jesus. And that's why I want to go back into worship today because worship is a beautiful way to fix your gaze on Him. You know, I was talking about Jill and I getting married in 2005. We get married. And this is when I think of behold, I just think of this moment. And I've been thinking about this with, with God today. I'll just never forget, like, the first reveal for us. You know, I, I went ahead and went into the, the auditorium where we were getting married. And I was just standing there looking at kind of, I guess, at the altar or the front of the, build, of the room. And then Jill comes in the back of the room. And I, I kind of hear her coming in, the door shutting. And I'll never forget turning around and beholding my bride, the radiance of her beauty. And like locking eyes with her. And it was so surreal. Like we're getting married. And like all this energy all the way around it. But just recognizing that from that moment forward, it wasn't going to be Mark and Jill. It was going to be Mark and Jill. Like from that moment forward, we were together. And I think that's what beholding does. We lock gaze. And now here we are, however many 17 years later, here we are. Woo, here we are. Guess what? We haven't separated. We're still together. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to lock eyes with him so that 17, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, we are still pursuing God and the things of God and the call of God. That we would just lock eyes with him and just brag on Jesus today. Just 
in worship and in prayer and in adoration. God, it is all about you, your beauty, your radiance, your power, your goodness. As Jill talked about earlier, I'm just going to go back through my story. I can't believe you saved me. I can't believe you set me free. I can't believe you called me. I can't believe you connected me to this vision of my friends to my right and my left. There's an endless list of adoration. I'm just going to keep my eyes locked on Jesus. And that's what's going to give us power out of this room after this chapel. We would turn, we would remove, and then we would behold. Stand to your feet all across this place. We're going to go back into, into worship and prayer. And so I'm just going to free you guys, your leaders. So I, I love that. I love about, about this room. I don't feel like I have to, 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 to walk you through these next few moments. I want to fully empower you. The only thing I'm asking is no distraction, no phone. Don't leave this moment without having the opportunity in any area of your life. Just allow the image of God to flourish and to grow. So turning, removing. And I think for all of us, as we're finishing even out this worship set in a few minutes, that there would just be an electric praise. Come on, we're only in this warehouse for like two more weeks. Let's take the roof off of this warehouse because we're beholding the glory of God. Come on, hands lifted up. Jesus, we love you today. And God, we're just reminded today of the gospel, the good news, that we were lost. We were sinners. We were broken. We had no hope. But you came and stepped into our mess and you made a way. God, I thank you that your image was always in us and it's growing through the power of your Holy Spirit more and more, glory after glory. So God, we just say that any issue, any hindrance, any wall, any separation that would keep us from that journey today, it ends. We turn, we remove, we behold. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's worship.
you are, I just want to pray over you all right now. Father, I thank you so much for every life in this room. I thank you for the story that you're writing in them and through them. God, I thank you for calling them to this place for such a time as this. God, thank you for your transforming power that is changing every single one of us from glory to glory. God, we say all over again today, our lives are for you. God, lead us, direct us so that we can bring you glory. We pray as Highlands College students, we want more of you and less of us. We want more of you and less of us. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you for your power. God, we give you all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for moments like these. Come on, Highlands College, let's tell amen. Thank you. And I want y'all to help me honor Mark, but I'm so thankful for a leader leader who leads us. Y'all, we can make this complicated sometimes, but I'm so thankful for leadership that just brings us back to the simple place of let's get in God's presence and let him transform us with his power. Can y'all help me honor Mark? President Mark. That was so good. I needed it. But hey, Let me encourage you. We need to do this in our walk with the Lord time and time again. Don't wait for chapel. Y'all, you got your own Holy Spirit power. Go in your bedroom, in your car, wherever. You got the same thing that can happen in your very own room with you. Okay, so don't wait for chapel. Um, I've got a few announcements. Y'all ready for announcements? Okay, we got some exciting stuff coming up. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, okay? Where we would normally have chapel, we have a guest that's coming to uh, train us, which is going to be incredible. His name is Tanner Peak. He is with, uh, he is the president of Every Home for Christ. And he's going to be coming and training in cross-cultural evangelism. Come on. I'm going to be there. I want to be trained in this area. It's absolutely incredible what Every Home for Christ has done. They have shared the gospel in more than 2 billion homes since 1946. Come on, they know what they're doing. So next Tuesday at 10 o'clock in Pastoral Prac. What day? What time? Where? Y'all are amazing. Okay, so um, next Tuesday, 10 o'clock, Pastoral Prac. Come, get trained. It's going to be absolutely incredible. And then this Thursday, we're going to have a guest speaker. Speaker, uh, speaker, say it. Pastor Stephen Chandler is coming to speak at chapel, and we've got preview day, so we're going to have a lot of guests in the room. It's going to be amazing. Y'all always take time to say hi to preview day guests and their parents or their whoever brought them. It means a lot to them, and y'all be praying that God would call them, just like he called every single one of you. Say, God, speak to them. Let them hear you, and if they're called to be at HC, let them come. Okay, so y'all agree in prayer with us, and y'all have an amazing lunch. We love you. We see you on Thursday.